I think they did. Come, come <laughs> preach to us, brother. Thank you, Brother Tom. What a great blessing and joy it is to be again at the Memphis School of Preaching and always certainly to be uh, a part of this lectureship. Uh, it's always a joy to be here. You, you're encouraged. You're built up. Uh, the Bible says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we do that. Uh, when we assemble together as we are doing this week. I, I don't know if you heard the previous lecture by Brother Mark, but what a marvelous job when we think about it, loving our neighbor. And we really appreciate all of the lectures that we have been able to hear and to be a part of uh, during this week. You know, it, it's kind of interesting when you, when you look out uh, in our world, we know what's going on in our world. It's, you know, it's kind of confusing sometimes. Uh, you know, things uh, have been up and down and up and down, and you'll develop, if you're not careful, it's easy to develop the wrong attitude. I thought about the old boy was laying on the couch, and uh, he went to sleep, and one of the members of the family put some Limburger cheese on his mustache, just rubbed it across there. When he got up, he, he, got, he said, it, it stinks in this room. He walked outside, and he said, the whole world stinks. Well, you know, you may, if you're not careful, you may get that idea sometime. The whole world may stink. But when you and I go back to the Word of God, and we recognize the goodness of God, according to Romans chapter 11, and verse number 22, then we learn that we can go back to the Word of God, and as a result of that, be built up. John chapter number 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not where thou goest. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 12, verse number 48. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I speak unto you, they shall judge you in the last day. Matthew chapter number 25, the Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in all of His glory and all of His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory, and there shall be gathered together all nations. He'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. You and I have a picture of the judgment. We see another picture of this in Revelation chapter number 20. I saw a great white throne, and Him that sat upon it from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the book according to their works. You and I need to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. In John chapter number 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine. My Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. You and I must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that it is the word of God that we must follow. And when the Bible speaks to you and I of the goodness of God, behold the goodness of God. You know, we think about the prayers, little children are taught, God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for this food. You and I know that God is good. I think I'm speaking to an audience this afternoon in which you and I recognize and know that God is good because we love God. We know that God loves us. But this afternoon, I want us to look, I'm going to look at four things that help us to have a better, I hope, understanding of the goodness of God. The first thing I want you to look at when this afternoon is this. The goodness of God is seen in His person. Now, when you and I look at God, 
The Bible tells us no man has seen God at any time. I'm reminded of the little boy in Bible class, and the teacher had asked them to uh, draw a picture of, of God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. And so this little boy he was drawing the picture, and, and uh, he was drawing. He said, this is a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, nobody knows what God looks like. He said, well, they will when I get through. <laughs> you know, so you, you, if you're going to draw a picture of God, if you and I are going to, you know, you think about the, the, the picture of God, how would you draw that picture? Well, look at several things out of the Bible. Number one, God is a creator. In Genesis chapter number one, in the beginning, God created the heavenly earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. God said, let there be light. The Bible says that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are God's creation. If you want to see a picture, in the book of Colossians, chapter number 1, verse 15, you remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that I am the image of God. You want to see God? Look at His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, when you and I understand, you make something. God made us. God knows what is in us. The Bible teaches us, you know, God, as some have said, you know, He's got the hairs of our head numbered. God knows our heart. God knows who we are. It's kind of interesting. Several years ago, this was back in 1981. Uh, I guess Ford Motor Company at that time made what was to us in the United States a new automobile. Now, it wasn't to them because they had been producing this automobile in uh, European countries probably four or five years before they brought it to fruition here in the United States. But in 1981, Ford Motor Company made a little car called the Escort. Well, I, I'm telling you, when I saw that, I thought, wow, I've got to have one of those. I go to the Ford dealership, and I buy this Ford Escort, little old white two-door car, autom not automatic, but a standard transmission. I was living in Michigan at the time in the Detroit area, I had to, I was going up in the, I, now when you look at Michigan, this is the southern peninsula of Michigan. Now you've got the northern peninsula. And I was going somewhere up in, the, in the, this portion of Michigan. I don't remember now what for, but I went up there. And I drove this little escort on the way. And it, it was probably sometime late October or early November. I was driving back to the Detroit area. And I went through a snowstorm. Well, when I did, the, the, it, the car just kind of floundered on me. I, I pulled over the side of the road, and I thought, I, mean, I didn't have probably maybe 15, 16,000 miles on it. So I, I go, and it kind of flounders. And I sit there for a few minutes, and after a while I start, well, it goes again. So I go down to the uh, Ford dealership, and, well, we'll make this adjustment and that adjustment. And I thought, everything's fine. Later on, probably after Thanksgiving, maybe we were going to Tennessee at Christmas, and I'm driving this little Escort, and just south of it, it did the same thing. Well, I take it back to the dealership, and the guy said, well, I'll tell you what you need, Mr. Aco. Now, now by then, I'm, I'm on up getting into the mileage, and they said, uh, we figured out what you need, a new carburetor on that car. But now it's past the warranty time. Now, whenever this way, it's past the warranty. And they said, here's what we're going to do. We'll put a new carburetor on there, and you pay half of it, and we'll pay the other half. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Because the problem started before it ever ran out of warranty. So I'm not going to do that. So I, was, I tell everything I know, folks. If you want to know, <laughs> I tell everything I know. So Wednesday night, I'm teaching my Bible class. I tell about what has happened to my car, and there is a lady in our Bible class that Wednesday night. She came to me, and she said, Brother Acuff, what you, tell me about this car situation. And I told her. She said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, she worked in the glass house. Now, the glass house is in Dearborn, Mission. Oh, many stories. How That's the, the corporate headquarters of Ford Motor Company. She said, uh, "Just uh, I, let me see what I can do. Well, a few days later, I get a call from a fellow. 
He said, Mr. A. Cup, I understand you're having a problem with your escort. I said, yes, sir, I am. I th he said, well, you bring it to a certain location. Tell him where to bring it. I took it. He said, I'll have your car there. So I left my car with him, and I, I took his car, drove it for about a week. He called me one day, and he said, your car's ready. Come pick it up. When I found out he was the man who designed the Ford Escort, he fixed that car. Ladies and gentlemen, he, he is the person who designed it. When you and I see God as our creator, ladies and gentlemen, he made you. He made Larry Aka. So we see, when we see the goodness of God in his power, we see, we see he is the creator. Now, we also see that, that, ladies and gentlemen, he's a consuming fire, according to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. The Bible said God is a consuming fire. Hebrews tells us uh, that as well. When you and I look, we know that the Bible describes it. Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Genesis chapter number 18. So we see God as a creator. We see God as not only a creator, but we see him as a consuming fire. We see him as a destroyer. Now keep in mind, we're looking at the goodness of God and we're looking at his person. But we also know that he's a God of love. John 3, 16, that, uh, last night, uh, you know, uh, Brother Dan Winkler helped us so much with that. We see uh, Brother Mark's lesson today. And we look at John 3 and verse number 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an ancient love. This is not a love that came into it. Well, uh, I've decided I'm going to love. No. Go back to Jeremiah 31, verse number 3. Uh, of old and for everlasting, we see the ancient love of God. This is not something that just started. We see the immeasurable love of God. Psalm 103, as, as the height of the earth, it's high above man. Ladies and gentlemen, we see not only that, but we see the practicality of God's love. While we, Romans tells us, Romans 5 verse 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at the goodness of God. And, we, and then in Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Never, listen, nevertheless, I live, yet not I but the life I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God, listen to that, who loved me and gave himself for me. You and I see again that practicality, the immeasurableness, the ancientness, the divinity of the love of God. When you and I look at the goodness of God, when we see the goodness of God, we see it in his person. He is a forgiving God. Psalm 85 verse 2. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. You and I understand that he is a God of mercy. In Psalm 100 verse number 5. His mercy endureth forever. So when you and I, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at, we're looking at, at this goodness of God. We see the goodness of God. We see it in the person of God. He's good. God is good. But I want you to see, you know, you think about the goodness of God. I want you to look at the goodness of God is seen in his patience. Now watch, the Bible says, When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, 1 Peter 3.20, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. We see the patience of God. I'm sure that you and I wonder sometime why we look at our world. We look, you know, the Bible says the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot reach, neither is yours heavy that he cannot hear. Your sin has separated between you and God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no man upon this earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And we look at what is going on in our world today and we say, How long the long suffering of God? God is not willing that any should perish. He's long suffering. The Lord, the Bible says, He is not slack concerning His promises, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. 
You know, sometimes we don't understand people. <laughs> we don't, you know, things happen and we don't understand. I, I thought about this old boy. Now, I, I'm from Tennessee. I was born and reared in Tennessee, so I'm a hillbilly. Yeah, my name is Acuff. You know, I, I a lady at church one time came out, and she asked me. I was holding a meeting, and she said, Brother Acuff, you can to Roy Acuff? I said, Yes, ma'am, I am, but I can't sing. She said, Well, he couldn't either, so it worked out <laughs> real good. So when I said to uh, this, there was this old hillbilly. This old hillbilly, I don't know what he'd been doing with his taxes, but he'd been doing something with his taxes. And the Internal Revenue Service decided to kind of investigate this, so they go to his home or where it was, and so they're trying to put all this together. And, and the uh, IRS agent said to the boy, said, uh, we need your passcode to your computer here. He said, you ain't getting it. You ain't getting mine. Well, the guy said, well, if we don't, then we're just going to have to arrest you and put you in jail. Well, he said, okay. He said, my passcode... Is Cinderella, Snow White, Dopey, Grumpy, Minnie and Mickey, and Nashville. Well, he said, what kind of passcode is that? He said, well, they said six characters and a capital. Well, now look. <laughs> when we're looking at the patience of God, you look at... at, at God is not willing that any should perish. Why do we, we see all that's going on in our world today? We ask the question, how come? Patience of God, folks. I thought about uh, you, the old boy was got his car stalled at a red light. And the fellow behind him kept banging, beating in the horn, banging in the horn. And the guy in the car that wouldn't start, he got out of his car and he walked back and he knocked on the window of the fellow. He said, sir, he said, I will sit here and blow your horn if you'll come up and try to start my car. <laughs> Don't you and I get impatient? You see, ladies and gentlemen, I want, in Titus chapter number 2, I want, to, I want to draw a little picture of your patience of God because when you and I think of the patience of God, we must understand the grace of God. The Bible teaches... For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship. You're familiar with Ephesians 2, uh, 8, 9, and 10. When you and I see the patience of God, ladies and gentlemen, we see the grace of God. And in Titus chapter number 2, uh, the Bible says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. When you and I look at that verse of Scripture and I think of, I think of the grace of God, I think of God's patience. Draw you a little box. And on the outside of that box... I want you to put some words, put the word purify, put the word redeemed, you put the word justification, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying God, we should live, why? Because we've been redeemed, we have been justified. Why? Because of the patience of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you and I go back to the book of Genesis. And the Bible says the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. The goodness of God is seen in his patience. And so in this box, I want, I want to just put three words. When you and I look at this, I want you to put, uh, you know, I want you to put the word looking and living inside this box. I want you to put the word learning. Listen to this. Teaching us. You see, we have to be taught about the grace of God. It's not a feeling. It well, I'm a, I remember several years ago, my wife and I were studying with a family. And we had studied. I, I have used for years the Joe Miller uh, 
Well, they used to be film strips. Y'all know what? Bing, and you know, you're not old enough. But the, we, we had the film strips, and then we had the uh, cassette tape that would automatically run it, and then we had the VHS, and they have got the DVD, and now we've got the uh, flash drive. But we'd study the Bible. We had gone through all five of these lessons, and we were leaving this last night, and to my knowledge, this person never obeyed the gospel. But when we were standing in the kitchen, and he said, Brother Acuff, when I feel it right here, I'll do it. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. Feeling comes after action and not before. You and I, you see, I lived, again, I'm... I'm not a farmer, as Mark, Brother Mark talked about being a farmer. I'm not a farmer. I moved to Sparta, Tennessee. They tried to make a farmer out of me and finally gave up. And, I, I mean, I'm, they would watch me. I had these logs, and I'd, I'm, trying to, I'm hit, trying to break those logs up. And they come by, and they'd help me. But think about this, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to cut down a tree, and so you're standing over there. Well, what, you're going to cut down a tree? I'm going to cut it down. When? Well, when I start sweating. No. When you start cutting, you'll start sweating. <laughs> and so when you look at the grace of God and we say, teaching us implies learning. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worries us. That we should live. Not only the grace of God is, implies learning, but it implies living, ladies and gentlemen. Teaching us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That you and I recognize again that the, it is essential, not only that we learn something, that we live a certain way, but now watch this. Looking looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Ladies and gentlemen, the patience of God implies his grace. When you and I look at the goodness of God and we look at the patience of God, I don't have time to develop this this afternoon, but we could also go to Hebrews chapter number 11 and we see faith. Do you remember what the Bible says about uh, Noah? By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. That you and I recognize that we see the grace of God and that we see, and all of this, ladies and gentlemen, connected to the patience of God. Souls are being saved today that would not have been saved if God did not delay His coming. Have you ever thought about that? We live at Lithia Springs where I work. There are 95,000 households within a 25-mile radius of our church building. Listen, we have things to do, folks. So when you and I see the goodness of God... I thought about the patience of God, and I think about Larry Acuff. Larry sent, we, you know, man, what did I do that for? I thought about this kindergarten teacher. She was teaching kindergarten. It was in the wintertime. There's a little boy. It's time to go home. I guess the bus coming, and he was struggling getting his boots on. And so she helped him get his boots on, and once she did, she discovered that he had them uh, on the wrong feet. Now, she's a kindergarten teacher, so, uh, okay. So she takes the boots off, and so then she struggled. That big, they're just hard to get on, and she's struggling, and she puts them on. And once she gets them on his feet, he said, uh, these uh, are not my boots. <laughs> So she takes them off. And about the time she takes them off, he said, they're my brothers. Mom had me wear them today. <laughs> so she struggles. Now, I don't know about, I, I'm, I'm not a kindergarten teacher, folks. But, but you got to thank God for these wonderful people who teach kindergarten. 
I have a, my wife has a niece. She's been teaching, and I'm not going to tell you how many years. I, it's in excess of 40. She loves it. I, God bless her. But so teacher gets them on, got to, finally gets them on. And she said to the little boy, she said, where are your mittens? He said, they're in the boots. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I tell you that? The goodness of God, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the goodness of God, we see his person. When you look at the goodness of God, we see his patience. Aren't you thankful, ladies and gentlemen, that God does not deal with us according to our wickedness. You and I are grateful because He is good. We see His patience. Now, Romans 11 also talks about His severity. But now I want you to look at the third thing. We see the goodness of God in His presence. Now, I, I want you, there are three Psalms that I, wanna, I want to go into for a few minutes with you. When you look at these three psalms, and the first one is Psalm 90. The Bible says in Psalm number 90, Lord, thou hath been our dwelling place in all generations. You've been our dwelling place. If you have your Bible, it might be a good idea. You might want to go over there and mark that in your Bible so you can go back and look at this. Lord, thou hath been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth ever, thou hadst formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. I did a little study one time. Now, those of you who have studied Hebrew, I did not study Hebrew or Greek or English when I was in college. <laughs> but those of you who have studied some of the, and, and again, I, I did not study, so whatever I can find out, I just do a little research and that word dwell, now here's what I found out about the word. The Bible says you have been our dwelling place. The word dwell means to sit, to stay, to remain. How powerful is that? So when we talk about the presence of God, the goodness of God, ladies and gentlemen, you can't talk about the goodness of God without talking about His presence. Thou hast been our dwelling place. If you skip over to verse number or chapter number 91 and look at verse number 1, Lord, listen to this. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High wow, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And so when you and I look at that word, I think of Psalm uh, 27, verse number 4, uh, in which the Bible says, To dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you and I are looking at the goodness of God and we're looking at the presence of God, there is this kind of dwelling. You know, I heard a, a gospel preacher, I believe it was Brother Benji Slocum, but he is a great preacher. He was talking about, have you ever in your congregation, you have people who come and they'll be there for a while. You know, it's, they're, I call them drifters. He said, there's one thing you can always depend on when you're doing something from a drifter, and that is they won't be there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. God is our dwelling place. So when you look at Psalm 90 or Psalm 91, or if you go back over to Psalm chapter number 4 uh, and verse number 8, and when you and I, the Bible says we will rest in peace and safety dwelling with him. That you and I, we're safe. The, we know the devil is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. But when, when we look at the goodness of God, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at this passage of scripture and we're dwelling in his presence. Let me give you another passage. Psalm number 46, the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the earth shake with the swelling thereof, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. 
God shall help her in that right early. When I see in Psalm number 46, God is my refuge and strength. Remember, we're looking at the goodness of God is His presence. God is our refuge. We dwell. God is our refuge. I've told this story a lot of times. You could have heard it. You can take a 30-second nap. There was a lady. Uh, she was at work one day, and she got a call from the babysitter. And the babysitter said, you've got to come home. Your, but your child is sick, running a fever, running a temperature. You need to come home if you can. And so she goes to her supervisor, and she said, I need to go home. Is it possible? Can I? And I said, she's my, my baby's sick. I need to get home. She said, sure, go ahead. That's, that's good. So she left on her way home. She called, and I said, you've got to hurry. The baby is really sick. She said, maybe you need to get some medication, stop it. So she stopped at a pharmacy, and she goes in, talks to her, got some medication. When she comes back out, she discovers she's left the key in the car and locked the door. She calls, the baby said, look, I, I don't know what to do. She said, you need to hurry. She said, maybe you can find a coat hanger. Did you ever try to do that, get a car in love? I, I never, I, I don't know, I always hung a coat on it, but you get a coat hanger. So she found something, and she, but she couldn't, un, she, she was working at it. Well, about that time, this great big old motor, bloom, 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 comes up. This old guy's sitting on it, and he got a do-rag on, you know, and a little long flowing beard, and he said, ma'am, can I help you? And she said, my baby's sick. I need to get home. I've locked the key in my car. I can't get in. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? He said, well, maybe I can. And so she, he fooled with it in less than 30 seconds when he had that door open. She grabbed him around the neck. She said, oh, man, you're a great man. He said, no, ma'am. No, no, ma'am. I'm not great. He said, I just got out of prison about 10 days ago for car theft. She grabbed him and hugged him again. She said, when God sends help, he sends a professional. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> God is our refuge and strength of very present help in trouble. Now, let me give you another one. The other one is Psalm number 27. The Bible says, the Lord is my light and my salvation the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, the Lord is my light. He's my dwelling place. He's my refuge. You know what our point was? The goodness of God is seen in His presence. He's my dwelling place. He's my refuge. He's my light. Ladies and gentlemen, when you and I, the Bible says, David said this, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Ladies and gentlemen, thy word, David said, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. The Bible says the light shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in a dark, sinful world, and we have to maneuver our way day by day with ungodliness, with those who want to do Christianity wrong. But the light of the Word of God will shine through to the day in which our Lord says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thy Word will lead us. Ladies and gentlemen, the goodness of God is seen in His person. The goodness of God is seen, ladies and gentlemen, in His patience. The goodness of God is seen in His presence. Ladies and gentlemen, the goodness of God is seen in his forgiveness of us. Think about that. When you and I think about the forgiveness of God, and we think, we, we think about the fact that we can be saved through him, the goodness of God is seen through that. When you and I look at it, for an example, 
the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to the book of Exodus, chapter number 12. In Exodus, chapter number 12, there is a, a prelude or a beginning. Do you remember the children of Israel are going to leave Egypt? And so what you have is you have uh, a lamb, spotless lamb, sacrificial lamb, a saving lamb, a shared lamb. If you read chapter 12 of Exodus, you're going to get those things. And then when you come over to the book of John, chapter number 1, and you look at John chapter 1 and verse number 29, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so when we see God and we see that picture, and we see the goodness of God, we see God in His love for us through this forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So we have in Exodus, and then here's the Lamb of God died on the cross. Colossians 1 and verse 13 and 14. The Bible says He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through His Son, the forgiveness of our sins. Ephesians 1 verse 7 tells us the same thing. In whom we have redemption through His blood. You and I know from Romans chapter number 6, and I'm not going to go through the details, you and I know that we come into contact with the blood of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, when we hear the Word of God and we believe in Jesus as a Son of God, when we repent of our sins, confess His name, we become dead to the world. We're buried in a watery grave of baptism. We're resurrected to walk in a new life. Ladies and gentlemen, we come into contact with that blood. When you and I think about the goodness of God, we see the goodness of God in all of these areas. But as you and I think about this last point, I thought about, there was, there was just, I think in England, some of you could have read this, a young boy, he got lost. This was, this was around London somewhere, he got lost. And there was a policeman trying to, trying to help him find his way and uh, he had named streets, and here's a street, and there's a street. And the little boy said, no, sir, I, I don't recognize any of those. And the policeman thought, well, I'm going to have to kind of go out in the edge of the city and begin to name a few streets. And then he said to the little boy, he said, you know what, out here, and he, he said, there's some church out there that's put a, a big cross, a big lighted cross. Oh, the little boy said, yeah, I know where that is. He said, I live just right close to it. And the little boy said to the policeman, you get me to the cross and I can get home. Ladies and gentlemen, you get us to the cross and we can get home. It is the cross. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you.